Hey, music junkies. Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. If music moves your soul, you're going to want to be part of this community by subscribing below to this channel so you don't miss out on our daily content, always celebrating the best of the rock era. Also, become a patron to help us curate this great history. Now, I'm excited to bring you another episode from our series, Revelations, where, of course, featured artists reveal rare stories about their biggest songs, along with fascinating insight about their careers. On this installment of Revelations, really excited to present episode one of our recent Zoom session with Mike Linda from Multi-Platinum 80s Funk Sensations, Level 42, one of my favorite bands of the era, talking about his mind-blowing falsetto and his hand in helping create one of my favorite songs of all time and just a standout top 10 smash from 1986, Something About You. And that's where our story begins on Revelations. One of my favorite songs of all time. Such a jam, such a feel-good song. Both versions, I love the longer version with the, the long intro. Yeah. just the funk inside of that but tell me about that co-written by you and the guys that hit number seven on the billboard hot 100 it was number four on the dance club songs chart number six in the uk and uh, i've always felt like something about you could be a song if it were used in a cool movie or something like that somebody needs to do that mm. that's why i was number one of my top five songs that need to be used from the 80s so I feel like it could have that big relaunch like Don't Stop Believing My Journey in Africa by Toto because it's just one of those songs that everybody hears and they're like, man, this is such a great jam. Mm. Tell me about that song, writing it, what you remember. Well, uh, funny, it's, um, it kind of grew in stature as the whole process went from the beginning to completion. You know, it started off, uh, we were in the rehearsals. Um, you know, Mark had sort of uh, made a, a, a kind of proclamation, basically, saying, listen, this is after True Colors and the preceding albums. This band could be so much bigger. You know, we, we could have a lot more success if we spend a bit more time writing and don't go into the studio with like half the ideas, but actually demo the songs beforehand, kind of finish them as much as we can and really know what we're doing before we get into the studio. And so that was the plan. And so we spent a long time and, and, and the demo of something about you was, we were all very excited about, I mean, it had started off um, in the, after a rehearsal, I just started playing someone on the keyboard and Phil kind of went, what was that you just played? I said, what was what? He said, play that again. So I just played this thing. I mean, the first thing that happened was going, there's the, I was playing when Phil said what's that you're playing I said I don't know it's just it's just this and he said play it again and he did this thing because the, the that bit I think I just did that once as a sort of throwaway thing and he said no that's really good you should do that every time and so that was the sort of start of the riff and it was Wally who came up with the the answer to it which was when we were doing the demo Wally kind of came up with the uh So that was kind of Wally's contribution to the bass line. And then it was Mark that came up with the... And uh, yeah, so, and then, then I, so I came up with it. the same sequence which meant that when the it's all right they both work over that together oh yeah man what a treat thank you so much that's awesome and it was just the 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 do 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 with the with the three chords and um and sort of phil 
came up with a sort of because I don't know about you as as just just those words, and we sort of presented it to Mark and Wally and and Mark had a demo studio at the top of his house, and he kind of worked on it with Wally, and he came up with the whole verse sequence with it and the. So we sort of put those bits together and then we needed a bridge and I came up with it. And uh, often what happened is, is the music would come first and then the melodic ideas with no lyrics mm-hmm. and then the lyrics would come last. And you'd listen to the song and think, oh, well, obviously the lyrics inspired the music, but it was always pretty much the other way around. And so we had this demo of the song with with kind of, you know, Phil's slightly unfinished lyrics, but we knew it was it was going to be good. Then we went to the studio. We started laying it down, working with Julian Mendelssohn, who was a fantastic engineer. And uh, we put down all the tracks as backing tracks because we used to sort of do that old fashioned thing where we do play the whole song as a four piece, do another take, do another take. And then sometimes Phil would say, I don't like the drums on this take, but I like the drums on this take. Can we cut it and stick it in? So we'd literally, Julian, be cutting the tape, the master tape, two inch, slicing it together. We'd be sort of listening. Is it okay? Does it feel all right? I mean, you know, the kids don't know they're born these days with the cut and paste. It's so easy compared (laughs) to how it is. Anyway, we got the backing tracks. And funnily enough, out of all of the songs on World Machine, the, the backing track of something about you without vocals felt really kind of leaden and uninspiring. And we were kind of distraught because this was the best, one of the best sounding demos. And yet when we were doing it for real, it just wasn't happening. And so Phil and Mark and Wally, you know, they really kind of said, okay, let's see if we can beef up the drums. And so Phil added a, an extra snare sound and Wally came up with a sort of bass synth thing and uh you know that we worked on the sound and it's really started to happen and then out of nowhere boone suddenly walked in with this whole new set of lyrics and we looked at them and uh mark kind of looked at them and he was kind of like in more or less in charge by that stage you know and he kind of said i think these are better lyrics than yours, Phil. And kind of Phil took the hump, as you can imagine. And we went, you know, behind the mics and, and started to sing the song. And as the lyrics went on and as the vocals went on and as the harmony started to build up, suddenly the thing came alive and it was like, oh my gosh, what have we got here? And we invited the a r guy from Polydor, Alan Sizer, to come in and have a listen. And he went, yep, that's a single. And uh, so that was the lead single for World Machine. And, you know, as you you said, it, it just was our most successful song to date. And um, I think part of that also was the fact that Polydor were prepared to put some money into the videos, which record companies were doing. And we had this whole um, catchphrase, <laughs> which Mark invented, called Think Rolex. The idea was that we weren't really great actors. We didn't look as glamorous as someone like Duran Duran. But if we had a really great video for this song that looked really expensive, um, it might really help the song. And so uh, we got in a proper drama director, Stuart Orme and his company, and they came up with the treatment, which involved a lot of acting and story and not really sitting behind the instruments and just miming. And, uh, you know, Stuart brought in Sherry Lungi uh, to, to be the sort of lead female now she'd just come from finishing filming the mission with Jeremy Irons and Robert De Niro in Brazil and now you know working with like Robert De Niro the next day she's working with four musicians that have never acted or learned (laughs) acting chops in their life Uh, but she brought a you know kind of gravitas to the whole story and you know Mark did the clown thing and he did that really well and um the roles seemed to be really well chosen. Phil as the sort of tempestuous artist really suited him down to a T and Boone loved his sports car. So casting him with the, you know, the AC Cobra was, was perfect. And then, you know, me as the sort of classical writer and coming up with, with stuff. And I was the one that had gone to college and studied. So it, it all was kind of apropos. And, um, 
and the fact that the, it didn't have a sort of obvious storyline and there were some question marks seemed to work. I mean, this is with hindsight, obviously, but we had this really, you know, great video to go with it. Uh, but the song itself just has obviously stood the test of time. And, and that's something that we could never have, you know, orchestrated or arranged. It just so happened that the synergy, the synergy just worked. And, the, you know, the, the way that we played and the vocals and the arrangement and the timing and just everything just seemed to happen. That's how the great ones do, it seems. But this song was acknowledged in 1991 BMI Awards for one million U.S. performances. As a young kid, I always wanted to go behind the song, figure out how it came together, how the magic. And it sounds like there was a true magic in the, in the studio when he came with the lyric change. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was like when, when we came back into the control room to listen to it with all the vocals that we put on, it just, it just had this larger than life thing. And it, it wasn't only the vocal performance. It was just the, the vocals with the music and the fact that they just blended so well. But making mistakes. And, uh, and the lyrics. And I mean, it's a love song. I mean, you know, it's obvious to say so, but it's, 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 not, it's not an A to B love song. It's a kind of, you know, going to B and C and F and then getting back there in terms of the lyrical content. But a lot of our songs um, are breakup songs. And there are very few that are actually, you know, I love you type songs. And uh, Something About You is one. I think Lessons in Love is just about another. <laughs> So uh, that helped as well. I mean, we might have sold more records if we'd written a few more love songs, but then. <laughs> <laughs> well, that falsetto, I mean, as I've said before, one of the greatest falsettos recorded on a song from the 80s, in my opinion. I've, it's just, it's one of those that I've heard it thousands of times, mm. but it, uh, it always just makes the hair on my neck stand up. Hits me right in the feels. When you were doing that falsetto, is there anything that stands out to you in the recording studio? Because it's, it's a flawless performance. And what I love about it is you have your falsetto, but then Mark with his, it's this distinction of two different voices, seems mm. lyrics that are very emotionally charged. It's one of those songs that when you're in love and you hear that song, it just, it's where the rubber hits the road. I'll throw just a few memories as they come. Um, it's funny, I was talking to Julia today because, uh, um, you know, I'm kind of rebuilding my studio and I was just trying to remind myself of, of, you know, what microphones I use. This is a very sort of technical question, but I know that, you know, different singers and different microphones seem to go together. You know, there are, there are a few sort of standard things and I remember using the, the Neumann U87 a lot and Julian confirmed, he said, yeah, that's the one that we used pretty much most of the time on your vocals. And I remember standing at that 87 in the studio singing and I think this was the first time that um, it was suggested that I triple track the vocal. I've always been very good at double tracking. In other words, if I sing a line, I seem to instinctively kind of know what inflections I've used. And then when I do the double track, um, sometimes I, I, was, I was able to track it just naturally so well that sometimes it would almost phase itself out in places. Um, and, uh, you know, and if it was a bit loose, then you drop in and fix it. But there wasn't that much fixing to be done. But it was suggested that on this particular line, I do a third track, as it were. So there were, there were three of my voice blended together on that line. And I think that's part of what gives it the smoothness. Obviously it has the characteristics of, 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 of my voice, but um, yeah, I mean, I just enjoyed it. Uh, I, I mean, I really enjoy singing. I enjoy, you know, doubling up, you know, melodies and adding harmonies and, uh, um, and we were in the hands of, of, of a fantastic engineer who really knew how to get the best out of, the voice and uh, uh, <laughs> he had very good ears. And if you went out of tune, you know, he's Australian and very kind of um, 
uh, let me say, he, he's very, he's very direct. So, <laughs> you know, if you do a take, he just pressed the button and go tuning, which meant, okay, I, I've sung a bum note somewhere. He wouldn't say where necessarily, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, that was, that was the, the, the recording process. Um, and, uh, and then of course, reproducing it live was, was, uh, um, it, it was always not one of the easiest ones to do. There were certain songs that very easy to kind of reproduce live. Something about you um, has never been um, one that is particularly easy to perform. It's, it's like you've really got to kind of work at it to get the dynamics and get everything to happen. And we've been doing it enough for years that we know how to do it. But it was always one of those songs that uh, was uh, there was a lot of swan feet paddling under the water with this sort of serene presence on the top. And when the audience would watch it, they'd think, wow, it's effortless. But that song was never, for me anyway, was never effortless to perform. But the expression on people's faces when we perform it, you know, made up for it. Thank you for sharing that. That's that's great insight. Uh, I love, and the lyric too, it's such poetry that you're singing. So when you hear yeah. that falsetto and the undefined illusion, those diamond dreams, they can't disguise the truth. Mm. I mean, that's good stuff. It's almost like that. That those lines are kind of uh, are very, as you say, poetic and, and saying, um, you know, what is this thing called love? You know, how can how can I describe it? You know, it's it's kind of beyond words. And I sing that, and then Mark sort of it response is like, you know, because there's something about you. In other words, maybe I can't explain it, but all I know is, you are so right for me, and. Uh, I can't live without you. And so there's this kind of foil that's happening. And uh, I mean, it's, it's Boone's genius lyrics, basically. The other part about it is when you go into the second verse and the harmony there between you and Mark, fragile but free. We remain yeah. tender together. Not so in love. Oh my gosh. Not so in love. He's not so wrong. It builds that song so that when that second chorus comes around, it's game over. Yeah, I mean, I, I love the fact that, um, you know, the, the kind of bass drops out in that beginning of the second chorus, but then you've got the the bridge melody continuing as the chorus goes and then sort of interlapping and working together. And I mean, also, uh, uh, I do my own arrangement of it sometimes uh, in a solo situation. I'll just play it with voice and piano. And I've done that with, on Dominic's tours um, on the last tour I did, in fact, earlier this year. Um, he, he requested it and you know, the beauty of it is that even though none of the arrangement parts are there anymore, it's just the, it's slightly altered chords, but it's just the piano chords and me singing. But there is something about you, baby, so right. The power of the words and the melody, uh, you know, give it the strength and it's almost like that sort of tin pan alley test where you know if you can't play it with a piano and a vocal or a guitar and a vocal then it ain't a song kind of thing i love that that's exactly right when the bass drops out how did that happen was that something that happened in the studio when you're recording I would, or yeah, I would, I would that? it feels like to me that that would have been something that um, Wally had a really good arrangement brain and I f have a feeling, I don't know if I'm right, that Wally might have suggested, why don't we try in the second chorus, um, just da -da -da, just leaving the bass line, but uh, letting the, the top carry it and then sort of coming back in. And of course it gives it the whole dynamics, you know, that whole dynamics thing of I'm playing as loud as I can. Well, maybe if you stop playing for a bit and then you come back in, 
then you get the dynamics. So I, I, I have a feeling that that was what happened there. Your approach to harmonies, especially in this song, you guys had very distinct harmonies. It's something that, besides the jazz funk elements, it really set you apart from everybody else. What was your approach to harmonies? I'm always curious about how bands do that, if, if it's something that they practice or they just go right in and do it well i think um i think part of the 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 kind of character of of level 42 and its harmonies is the fact that um you've got people coming from different directions so i had a, a kind of classical music training having grown up in a house where uh you know my dad worked in tv and jazz arranging and my mum you know was in the folk scene and the records were from all genres so I had that in my background. You know, Mark and Boone were kind of self-taught, if you like. Um, and so, you know, Mark's harmonies probably come from the records he grew up listening to and uh, that inspired him. And, um, you know, again with Phil, he had a kind of semi-classical training because he went to the Royal Academy for, for a while. But... Um, so, uh, but he was very much into African music, hence his connection with Wally. And Wally, of course, brought this French African thing together. So, when people were kind of suggesting harmonies were in the studio, you get these sort of different approaches. And so, we try some someone's idea, and if that didn't work, we'd modify it with someone else's idea, or we'd throw it out and try something all together. You know, I I could sort of come up with something that was quite sophisticated and maybe quite quite out in a jazz way, which was sometimes rejected as being maybe that's a bit too out for this or it's a bit too it's a bit too sweet and we need something more direct and then i could modify sometimes if mark came up with something and okay that note doesn't really go with that what do you mean it doesn't go with that well you know it, it kind of clashes okay so what should i sing and so it would very much be a, a sort of group effort because you know you know harmonies are, are really important and you know you want to use them well and and use them effectively you don't just want to throw it all over everything because it sort of takes away the specialness of it and and there are times where you just want a, a simple lead line uh but we are all into harmonies and uh you know i mean you can hear that in the keyboard parts as well from myself and also from wally and uh you know we it was just it was just a style we developed and uh um yeah i can't really say any more than that well, 35 years later, the legacy of the song is that, of course, it's played all the time on radio. My kids love it, passed on to other generations. What is the legacy for you so many years later, looking back at that song and the joy this brought to people? Um, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it's always a pleasure to hear it on the radio um, or on a playlist and uh you know i get as i say i get to play my own solo version of it sometimes and i sort of just reappreciate the song and the and the power of the of the the lyrics and the and the the emotiveness um you know i probably some of my most coveted um you know gold discs or award discs are to do with that song um and you know given that we're currently in the COVID-19 pandemic where all live performance is gone um, I'm very thankful for the royalties that it generates because it is my biggest you know is my most successful co-written song that I've written and whilst that's something to be very proud of as an achievement there's always a competitive part of me that wants to you know, somehow write something as good or if not better than that one day. And uh, so that's the game to play for. Thanks for watching. Leave us a comment about Mike, about Level 42 and this classic song. Just a feel good, great song below. Click on our Amazon links to celebrate Level 42's latest music their merch in the description. Also, if you like our content and you love the greatest music of the rock here, we invite you to subscribe below 
Also, support us on Patreon to help us keep curating this history of these great artists and these songs. Help us keep the music alive. Until next time, three chords and the truth, my friends. See you later.